take comfort in the fact that God is sovereign over all the circumstances of your life and praise God in the darkness. Let God's word strengthen your heart. There should be a passion in our heart to tell everybody how they can come to know Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 12, verse number 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. Thank you so very much. You may be seated. May God help us to uh, hear and understand his word today. Can we uh, pray together? Let's bow for prayer together. Father in heaven, thank you again for your word. And Lord, as we come, we pray that you would help us and give us attentive hearts to hear the message of it. And Lord, help me to to make the word understandable um, and clear so that we can apply this to our life. So we want to honor and glorify you, and we pray in Jesus' name, amen. I know that everyone here has heard of Federal Express when it positively has to be there overnight. Now, they might want to add to that motto, and you're willing to pay a fortune to that. Notice these prices going up there for mailing things out. Before there was the Federal Express, there was the Pony Express, The only reason we know about this is perhaps you've seen commercials about it or maybe you've read about it in history. This was a private express company that carried mail by relay on horseback riders. I'm sure you know that. The easternmost part of the Pony Express was St. Joseph, Missouri. The western terminal was Sacramento, California. The cost of sending a letter by Pony Express was $2.50 an ounce. If the weather and horses held out and the Indians held off, the letter, the letter would complete the entire 2,000-mile journey in a speedy 10 days. It might surprise you that the, the Pony Express was really only in operation from April 3rd, 1860 until November 18, 1861, just 17 months. Because right after that, the telegraph line was uh, invented and completed between two cities, and the service was therefore no longer needed. But it was interesting reading about this. Being a rider up for the Pony Express was a tough job. Uh, You were expected to ride 75 to 100 miles a day, changing horses every 15 to 25 miles. Other than the mail, the the only baggage you could carry contained a few provisions. You could have, you know, your lunch with you, some cornmeal, bacon, and so on. In case of danger, you had a medical pack that was very small. And in order to travel light and to increase speed of mobility, especially during Indian attacks, the men always rode in shirt sleeves, even during the fierce winter. Now, how would you recruit people to do this? This is a hazardous job. So let me read you what a 1860 San Francisco newspaper printed for the Pony Express. Wanted. Young, skinny, wiry fellows, not over 18, uh, must be expert riders willing to risk daily, orphans preferred. Wow. That was the honest facts about uh, that job there. Uh, This was a hard service. But you know, ironically, despite all this, the Pony Express never had a shortage of riders. In fact, they always had more than they needed for that service. Now, the reason I talk about that is I want to talk to you today about service to God. And we need to be honest with the facts about the discipline of serving God. You know, like the Pony Express, serving God is not for the casual person. It's costly. It requires dedication. It requires your life. 
And God doesn't want just anybody to serve him. God asks for people to serve him who will make him a priority in their life. Let me tell you something, beloved. God doesn't want a life where you just give him the leftovers. God wants, to be you, God wants you to put him as first place. God wants you to make him a priority. And so serving God isn't a short-term responsibility or a proposition. Unlike the Pony Express, God's kingdom will never go under. It doesn't matter how much technology that we discover in the world. Um, the kingdom of God will never, ever go under. There's always a need for people that will serve God. Now, the Bible clearly teaches that service to God is expected. When we're saved, we're born again, our sins are forgiven, the blood of Christ cleanses us, cleanses our conscience, gives us peace and forgiveness of sins. We have all of these blessings, and God does all of this, according to Hebrews 9.14, in order for us to serve the living God. That's what he says. God does all of this. Because in return, what God wants is he wants us to serve him. According to Psalm 100, verse 2, we are to serve the Lord with gladness. That's every Christian's commission. There's no such thing as spiritual unemployment. No such thing as spiritual retirement in the kingdom of God. We're to be faithful, we're to serve God until he calls us home, which is why God, when he saves you, he gives to every believer a spiritual gift. Do you know you've been gifted by God? You've been given a measure of grace by God so that you can serve him. Paul told Timothy this in 1 Timothy 4.14, neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy, but with the laying on the hands of the presbytery. God had given Timothy a gift for service and ministry, and Paul was reminding Timothy, Timothy, don't neglect that gift, because he was prone to do that from time to time, to neglect serving, to neglect the gift of God had given him. Two pastors were talking about their church members and what kind of members they had, and one pastor said, I have wheelbarrow saints. They're no good unless they're pushed. Yeah, that hurts, doesn't it? The other pastor said, I have lily saints. They neither toil, neither do they spin. But a believer that understands their gifting and their enablement from the Holy Spirit will not need to be pushed. They'll want to serve the Lord. As a child of God, that should be your desire. And, and the Bible gives many motives for wanting to serve God. One is obedience. We just want to obey the Lord. One is gladness of heart. The Bible says, serve the Lord with gladness. We should, we should in, have joy over the prospect that we could actually serve the living God, the one who has saved us. Love, we do it out of love because we love our, our God. I think the greatest motive for service However, it's just simply gratitude, gratefulness. Listen to what the prophet Samuel said. He was exhorting people to serve God in his day. And listen to the words that he said to them. He said, be sure to fear the Lord and serve him faithfully with all your heart, considering what great things he has done for you. It's a great verse. You know why we serve God? Because we realize the great things that he has done for us. So today, I want to talk about the discipline of service. Now, if you have been with us on Sunday morning, you know I've been going through a series of spiritual disciplines. These are habits, godly habits, that we need to cultivate in our life if we want to be all that God called us to be. We talked about the discipline of the Word of God and the discipline of prayer and the discipline of confession and forgiveness and giving and the discipline of worship. But this morning, I want to talk about the discipline of service. And I think that the greatest uh, set of verses on this is right here in Romans chapter 12. I think these are the greatest verses on service. I think these are the greatest verses on worship in the New Testament. What I want you to see are three important steps for enlisting in the service of God. Here's the first one if you're taking notes. Number one, here's the first step, a total dedication. A total dedication. This is where it begins. This is where worship begins. We like to talk about worship. There's a lot of facets to worship. A lot of people equate music with worship. We love music. We want to sing unto the Lord. But for him, music is not, it's not all there is about worship. It's just a part of it. 
This is what it's about right here. This is where it begins. Look at verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. This is where worship begins. We must surrender ourselves to the Lord fully, body, soul, and spirit. We give all to him. We give our mind. We give our heart. We give our will. We give all of our, the members of our body. We give ourselves fully to the Lord. Notice the request where he says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren. This is talking to believers here in this request. He's talking to God's people. He's not talking to those who don't know the Lord. God wants those who know him to, to serve him. Why is it that there are over 100 million church members in America, yet it just seems like the nation is in decline, spiritual decline? It's one of two things, either lost church members or those who are truly saved who haven't fully given themselves over to the Lord, completely dedicated themselves to the Lord. Now, why should we do this? Because look again in verse 1, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. What are the mercies of God? The mercies of God are everything that Paul wrote about in the first 11 chapters of Romans. And what is Romans about? Romans is the sum and substance of all the theology of salvation. He's talking about all the blessings that we get because we are saved, because we're justified, because when we put our faith in Christ, we were given the righteousness of Christ, the imputed righteousness of Christ. All of our sins are forgiven. We have an eternal home in heaven. We have access to God. We have peace. And we could go on. Everything that Paul talked about with reference to salvation, that's all the mercies of God. You understand that, right? You're saved because of the mercy of God, because of his great mercies to us. What is that worth to you? What is his love, his grace, his salvation, his justification, his propitiation, eternal security, ultimate glorification? What is that worth to you? That's the reason. This is gratitude for what God has done for us. This is the reason. But then the requirement. Look again in verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. The word pre present here, this is a technical word. This is a word that was used whenever in the Old Testament a, a worshiper would come and bring their, their gift to the altar. They would bring their sacrifice to the altar they would lay it fully. This was a, a burnt sacrifice, holy, fully given on the altar. This is the word that was used. They would present it there on the altar. This is what God is asking us. Now, when they did it in the Old Testament, it was normally a, a dead sacrifice. And so here God, he wants a living, present your body as a living sacrifice. This is the idea of Abraham and Isaac when Abraham presented Isaac on the altar, his own son. And you know that story there in Genesis 22. And Isaac, finally understanding what was going to happen, uh, when, uh, that he was going to be the sacrifice. You ever read that story? You ever get the impression that, you know, if he wanted to, I, I think, that, you know, Abraham was well in the age at that time, probably about 100 years old, and Isaac was this young boy. I don't think a 100-year-old man could tie me down if he tried if I wanted to resist him or outrun him. Isaac didn't do any of that. When he realized that he was the sacrifice, he willingly laid himself down on the altar. He presented himself as a sacrifice there. This is the idea behind the word here. God wants you. He wants all of you. He doesn't want part of you because Jesus didn't give us just a part of himself on the cross. He gave us everything. And God, in return, as your service to him, he wants all of you. This is, this is where your spiritual worship begins. You present yourself a living sacrifice. You're living, and, and, and yet there are, is something that dies when you present yourself to God. What is it? Your own will, your own agenda, your own desires, all of that dies. The old person dies. You give yourself fully to God and you say, God, I'm yours. For whatever you want, I am yours. This is worship. 
when we give ourselves to God. Worship is not just something that we do on Sunday at a public service, although this is very important. I can't tell you how important it is for God's people to come together publicly and worship God and encourage one another in the faith. It's important, but, but beloved, that's not all there is to it. It's something that we do, but it's something that we are. It's, it's who we are. We're living sacrifices. Present is a is an aorist in Greek. What does that mean? An aorist is a once-for-all action. You do it one time, and that's it. You don't have to repeat it. It's done once, and that's it. When you present yourself to God, you do it at one time, at one point in your life. You don't have to repeat it again because once you've done it, that's it. You belong to God. You give yourself to the Lord completely, and you say, God, I'm yours. I don't have to do that tomorrow. I already did it. This is not present tense. This is heiress. I did it one time. I made a decision. God, I'm yours. I'm presenting myself as a living sacrifice, and that's it. And you don't look back. You don't turn back. You live up to that commitment. I read where Cortez, when he landed at Veracruz in 1519 to begin his conquest of Mexico, he had a small force of 700 men, and in order to motivate them, he purposely set fire to the 11 ships. No turning back, guys. We're moving forward. The men on shore watched their only means of retreat sink into the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico. For a believer, when we present our body a living sacrifice, we burn all the ships. We burn all the bridges of retreat. We say, that's it. I belong to God, and that's it. No man, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God, Jesus said. This is, where, this is where worship begins. This is, this is it right here. If you come to church and you worship, but you haven't given yourself to God, you're doing your own thing, you're not really worshiping God. It begins by giving yourself to the Lord. And another result is this transformation that happens as we renew our minds. Look at verse 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you might prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. This is a result. We are transformed as we are renewing our mind. We're beginning to be able to discern what is good and pleasing, what is God's will. And we renew our mind through the word of God. The world is always on the outside trying to conform us and squeeze us into its mold. There's this ungodliness in the world that's trying to squeeze us and make us like it. But on the inside, we have the word of God that is transforming us. And it begins when we renew our mind. And it's this internal force of Scripture and God's Word that is conforming us to the image of Christ. While the world is trying to conform us from the outside, the Word of God is transforming us from the inside to be more like Jesus Christ. That's one of the transformations that takes place when we present ourselves to God. Now, most people don't sell out for God because they fear what God might ask them to do. I'm just afraid of what God might have me do. You know, and people ask, you know, what does all this have to do with my spiritual service? You know, well, first, your spiritual service, it's an outcome of your worship. You can't really serve God if you haven't given yourself to him. Your service is an overflow of you fully giving yourself to the Lord. It's not a replacement for your worship. It is an extension of it. You understand that? It's an extension of your true worship to God. So that means that everything that you do is an act of worship to Almighty God because you've given yourself to him. When I preach every sermon, I preach everything I do for God. It's an act of worship to the Lord. Even this morning, what I'm doing, it's an act of worship. Uh, helping out a brother in need, that's an act of worship. Ushering and, 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 and serving in that way, passing a plate or helping at the Lord's Supper or teaching a Sunday school class or, you know, encouraging another believer. Everything that we do is an act of worship to God because worship is not just what we do one time on Sunday. It's who we are. And once we've given ourselves fully to the Lord, that means everything we do from there on out is an extension of our worship to God. And so that's where it all begins. There can be no genuine effective service unless, first of all, we offer ourselves as a living sacrifice to God. I can remember this in my own life. 
when I was newly saved, I came here to Grace. Pastor Johnson was thundering the word of God like he used to do every Sunday. And my dad was saved under Pastor Johnson's powerful preaching. Um, I just remember as a teenager watching my dad um, get saved. And I can honestly tell you, I knew the old John Harmon. And after he got saved, the new John Harmon was not like the old John Harmon. I saw the power of the gospel. I saw what happened when my dad responded to the word of God and God saved him. And I would walk by his room and see him on his knees with his Bible open every day. And I thought, who is that guy? Who is that guy? That was a transformation. I saw the power of of the gospel before I ever heard it. And so my dad, thank God, he was not the kind of man that said, you know, Jerry, I'm gonna, I'm gonna let you choose whether or not you wanna come to church with me. My dad was not that kind of person. My dad said, get ready, boy, you're going to church. That was my invitation. Get ready, you're coming. Now, if I complain, I said, I wanna do this, I wanna do that, my dad would just say, look, you're coming to church. You're either coming willingly or unwillingly, but you're coming. You're either coming with no pain or you're coming with pain. So I'm glad, he, I'm glad he was that hard-nosed about it because I did come to church and I did get under the gospel and I did as a teenager gave my heart to Jesus Christ. And from there on out, I began to grow somewhat as a Christian. But I remember very specifically in my life when I was 15 years old, um, we, uh, the uh, teenagers were, were going to camp in an old yellow van. Um, some of you might remember. We've had several of those old vans. By the way, pray for our teenagers. They had a wonderful expedition last night. The bus broke down on the way, you know, back from Hershey Park. But we had this new bus and, you know, with a brand new battery. But, you know, sometimes, you know, young people, you just have to go through those things. (laughs) Especially in a Baptist church. It's just all part of it. I remember we had this yellow van that would break down at times, you know. But we were on a trip. I was going to camp, Christian camp, for the first time, sitting in that yellow van, And I just remember this so vividly that on the way up, this was like about a three or four hour ride to camp. I was sitting in the van. I was reading my Bible. I was reading the book of Joshua. And I just remember reading uh, that passage in Joshua where in Joshua 1.5 where uh, God says to Joshua, as I was with Moses, so will I be with thee. I will not fail thee. I will not forsake thee. And for some reason, and I know you've you've had this experience before, where a verse of Scripture kind of jumped off the page. It kind of jumped into your heart. And that's what happened to me at that time. And I remember very specifically at that moment, I prayed and I said, Lord, I give myself wholly to you. I'm presenting myself to you. Whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. You just let me know, Lord, what you want. I'm yours now. I just remember that experience And it wasn't long after that that God began to reveal to me what I should do. Um, You know, this is uh, several buildings ago when we were over here in this other building. And uh, but we had just started a Christian school, and Pastor Johnson came to me one day and said, "Jerry, I need a I need a janitor around here. I need someone that'll clean the church, get the get the church ready for the school, and do all that. You know, mop and you know whatever." And I said, "Uh, "Yeah, I'll do it." Now, he paid me. This is my first job. I got $50 a week. I remember that. $50 a week. I thought I was the richest guy in Baltimore, you know, as a teenager. But really, I was. I mean, I loved coming to church. I was always around here. It seemed like I was always just serving. And it was a joy just to be around Pastor Johnson and do whatever he wanted. I learned so much just by watching him and seeing what he did in ministry. And then I remember one day he came to me and he said, how would you like to preach? And I said, what? <laughs> He said, yeah, why don't you, we had, you know, preach to this group of students here, you know. Well, that was my first sermon, and I studied very, very hard for it, and uh, I had pe- pages of notes. The only problem is when I got up there, I, I forgot how to read, you know, for my first sermon. I, I, I think the sermon lasted three minutes long. It was a terrible sermon, and uh, I felt like, man, this is really not what God's calling me to do, I don't think, you know. But then I had another guy come to me, a man, and he said, hey, uh, this is a man from another Christian school, and he said, hey, I hear you preach. I'm like, yeah. He said, I know, I heard you preach, uh, you have have experience preaching. Well, you know, I got three minutes experience. (laughs) 
So why don't you come down to my school and why don't you preach to the, to the students there? And um, so I did. And I think the Lord blessed it that time. I was a little bit better. <laughs> but, and then God began to show me, hey, maybe this is what you should be doing. I remember cleaning this church, and when nobody was here, Pastor Johnson would leave his Bible and his notes on the pulpit. He did that, it seemed like, every Sunday. So while I was cleaning the church late Sunday night where everybody was gone, Pastor's Bible was still there, his notes were still there. So I would re-preach the sermon that he preached that day with his Bible and notes. And uh, some of the best sermons I ever preached, nobody was there to ever hear them <laughs> to an empty auditorium, you know. But I just remember God at that point, beginning little by little, I had this hunger for the Word. I had this hunger to make the Word of God clear to people. And then God really burned in my heart the fact that the Bible is the Word of God. This is the inspired and errant Word of God. And he gave me this solid conviction that what the church needs is they need the Word of God. And that was really what inspired me. And so, little by little, God began to make clear, hey, Take and preach the word. Make the word of God clear. And here's the point that I'm trying to make. That all came after I said, Lord, I'm giving myself to you. And I think the, the pattern normally is that once you say, God, I'm now yours. I give myself fully to you. And you really mean that. I think that what will happen is God will then begin to reveal to you what he wants you to do for him. The area of service. I think God will just begin to put those things in front of you. And you'll begin to see some of those needs. You know, I think sometimes people, they come to me and go, look, just give me a list of things to do. Well, I can do that, but I would really like for you to go to God and say, God, what would you have me do? And then keep your eyes open and be alert because the desires you have, the holes that you see, maybe here even in this church, they can be filled by you if you see that need and you're willing to jump in and you're willing just to serve. You know, God's a whole lot better at doing that than I am. He has, he's the one who gifts you. He's the one who made you. He will put those desires in your heart, the things that he wants you to do. But the first, there has to be this total dedication of yourself to the Lord. And I think that once you do that, God opens up the doors. We're glad you've joined us today for this broadcast of The Ever Living Story, a media outreach of Grace Bible Baptist Church in Catonsville, Maryland. It's our sincere prayer that this broadcast has touched the spiritual needs of your heart. The Lord Jesus Christ has come into this world to change our lives, to bring us eternal life. And Grace is a local congregation where the Word of God is very clearly preached as you've just seen. Our Sunday morning service starts at 11 a.m., so you still have time to join us. We're located just off exit 17 of the Baltimore Beltway at 1518 North Rolling Road, Catonsville, Maryland. Let me leave you with this thought. Remember, the Lord Jesus Christ has changed your life, and He wants you to live out every day of it for His ever-living story.